presenter is, uh, it's, it's my pleasure to introduce Rachel Nellen. Uh, I hope my pronunciation is okay, Rachel. Uh, her topic is native uh, speakerism. And uh, Rachel Nellen is an MA student in the TESOL program at California State University. Uh, since graduating with a bachelor's degree from San Diego State University, she has worked in the field of international education. She has been on the administrative side as an international student advisor, and she has also taught English to international students in the United States and abroad. After a year of working on the administrative side, she decided to teach overseas. She spent one year in Busan, South Korea, uh, teaching English to elementary school students. After getting her master's degree, uh, she's planning to find herself teaching English in a classroom again, either here in the United States or abroad or Turkey. Rachel, <laughs> you should consider that. She believes that a common language uh, has the power to bring people together. And this is what makes teaching language so special. Yeah, the mic is yours, Rachel. Thank you so much. I hope you can all hear me uh, OK. Yeah. Uh, so thank you for that introduction, uh, Farid. Um, and I am so grateful to be here with all of you. And uh, this is my first time speaking at this kind of in this setting. Uh, in a seminar setting. So I'm very grateful for the invitation. Uh, so thank you also to my wonderful teacher, uh, Dr. Seferolo. Um, I am very grateful to have her as an instructor and I'm sure everyone agrees. Um, she is just such a knowledgeable and caring professor. Um, I know some, if not all of us, at least some of us have had teachers that maybe are great at what they do and they know the subject material, but maybe they, like she touched upon in her presentation, maybe they don't have that caring, that necessarily care too much about their students or their su success. And um, uh, Dr. Seferoglo definitely uh, cares about all of her students, and it's so clear when you're uh, when you have the honor of learning from her. Um, so I am in the same program as Roger, who is also another one of the most impressive classmates I've ever had. <laughs> um, so I've known Roger for a little while now. Um, so I'm just very grateful to be here. And I will start hopefully sharing my screen. All right, can everyone see this? I hope. Okay, great. Um, so like it was introduced, my topic is about native speakerism. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how prevalent it still is, some implications of it, and uh, support a little bit about supporting the non-native speaker model in the classroom. Um, I'm still a little uh, somewhat new to this area. I'm about in my fourth or fifth year of working in international education in general. Um, but this subject really caught my attention about a year and a half ago. I had never heard of native speakerism before. And um, once I started looking into it, it, it was really interesting. Um, so I'm going to share this a uh, little bit about this with you today. Um, so first we'll just, uh, there are a few definitions of native speakerism, um, but in general, I'm going to use uh, the one that I have here, which is from Robert J. Lowe and uh, Marek Kizowiak in 2016. Uh, they referred to native speakerism as a widespread ideology, whereby those perceived as native speakers of English are considered to be better language models and that they embody a superior Western teaching methodology than those perceived as non-native speakers. Um, so English as a second language or ESL students uh, often judge their level of English by comparing it to a native speaker, uh, especially when it comes to pronunciation. And in my experience, I have definitely seen this. Um, occasionally my students would tell me, you know, I'm so sorry, I don't speak English well, um, or my English level is so low. And every time I just disagree, I say, you know, 
um, you're, you know, speaking with me and communicating with me effectively. And I think that is an amazing feat in itself. So because of this reason, I think that students should be taught that English speakers are very diverse and there's no one accent that is more correct than others. Uh, so next, I kind of, uh, I titled this The Consequences of Native Speakerism. And um, so first we'll just discuss a little bit, how does Native Speakerism affect ESL teachers, both Native and non-Native? So it does affect Native speakers as well as non-Native. Um, for Native speakers, for example, uh, they may not be taken seriously in a professional sense, because a lot of times, especially abroad, these teachers are teaching pronunciation or maybe just communication um, and conversation. So um, sometimes because of this, the students may not think that the native teacher knows the grammar rules, for example, or knows about the syntax or things like that. Um, and then for non-native speaker uh, teachers, Sometimes uh, they don't, or they have trouble finding jobs that require the use of English because there's this stigma about an accent or about a non-native speaker. And in a study by Shiri and Kisar in 2010, uh, speakers with accents were found to seem less credible and tr trustworthy than native speakers when reciting the same information. Um, so that was, Pretty recent in 2010, um, when a non-native speaker is considered less credible, like I said, it can reduce the likelihood of being hired as an English teacher. And the negative effect of on non-native uh, speakers or teachers um, is very, it's stronger than it is on native. So non-native speakers are affected by this more so than native speakers. All right, so uh, the prevalence of native speakerism, I'm going to go over hopefully briefly about a small project that I conducted with my classmates this past summer in 2020. Um, so what we did is that we analyzed these um, advertisements for English teachers from Asia and from Central and South America. So we compiled 25 of these advertisements from each region uh, to form this picture of hiring practices that are used. So what we did is we counted the number of times the following terms showed up in these advertisements. So the first one was native speaker, and then countries or citizenship, education, teacher experience, and age. So something to note is that native speaker, citizenship, and age are biological factors. So these are things that we can't really help. These are things that were where we were born, when we were born are things that aren't our choice. And education and teacher experiences are professional factors. So these often come from our choices in education and uh, employment and so on. So these are just a couple of the examples or sample advertisements that we found. In uh, yellow highlight, I have highlighted the professional, so education and um, experience uh, when that showed up. And in the red uh, are the biological factors. So as you can see in the top, native speaker or native fluent like English speaker. Um, and also on the bottom in Asia, and only, and only is in all caps, which is interesting, but uh, the requirements for applying to this job, you have to be from the US, the UK, Ireland, Canada, or Australia. And something that I found was interesting on the uh, bottom right there, I circled in red, is that um, they said that the applicants don't need any experience. So I found it interesting that it was a teaching job, but no experience was necessary. Um, to be fair, this could be that they will be trained after they're hired. Um, but I thought that was interesting to have an advertisement for teaching. 
All right, so this uh, slide shows the results of our small little study that we did. Um, like I said, a total of 25 advertisements were taken into consideration. And in general, um, Asia and Central and South America, so both, uh, both areas, had a strong emphasis on native speakerism and education. Um, the experience was valued in both regions as well, but a little more frequent uh, in Asia. And sorry about that. <laughs> and so in Asia, they valued citizenship by a very wide margin. And in Central America, age is more frequently used as a hiring factor. All right, some uh, more implications from this study in particular. So uh, discriminatory hiring practice in TESOL are still prevalent. Uh, it was focused heavily on the biological factor of nativeness. So 74% of the advertisements were asking for native speaking teachers. 84% of that in Asia and 64% in Central and South America. And so many non-native speaker teachers don't even have the opportunity to apply for these English teaching jobs, especially if it's based on citizenship. So um, to kind of reword that, it's almost like if you don't have the right passport, you can't even apply for these jobs, even if you have a lot of experience and you're fluent in English. Um, so in this case, sometimes they don't even take that into consideration. Um, so just a couple of small things that can be done uh, as colleagues, uh, even though there are some regions of the world that have improved uh, these hiring practices, um, we can still raise awareness that it is still happening. And I think it's also important to listen to and support our non-native teacher colleagues. So if they run into this issue, uh, have a conversation and a dialogue with them and see uh, other ways in which we can help. So that brings me to the non-native speaker model. Um, so this model in general, it integrates non-native speakers of English uh, in addition to native speakers as pronunciation models in the ESL classroom. Um, so one thing to know is a lot of students also in my experience don't like their accent or they wanna reduce their accent. And I think that's okay as long as it's to help with comprehension. Um, so if they're not uh, being able to be understood, for example, it's, it's definitely something that to work on. Um, but through this uh, model, successful non-native speakers are used and they can be used to illustrate the many voices of English speakers. And so we try to normalize these world Englishes that are used. Um, and in this way, non-native teachers can become the, mon the models themselves for pronunciation. And um, the hope through this model is that students can perceive uh, their peers and their teachers and themselves uh, in a more positive light. So they're expanding a little bit, a couple of the reasons uh, why I think the non-native speaker model is a good idea. Um, the first one, it models, the, like I said, various types of accents that are heard around the world. Um, it is more realistic. So a lot of times uh, students would like to sound like a native speaker, um, whatever that might mean in their uh, head. Uh, but it is more realistic for them to look up to someone who is a successful second language speaker. Um, so like the third bullet says, the non-native speakers are in general more accessible models and they also resonate with students' experiences more. So these people have been learning English just like the students are. They've gone through struggles similar to what the students have gone through. And I think that's a good thing to, to resonate with students as well. Um, and participants in TESOL again, hopefully may start to perceive non-native speakers in a more positive way in that there's nothing wrong with an accent. Uh, being an English speaker uh, really doesn't 
it doesn't matter whether you're a native speaker or, or not. Um, and it also teaches students that their non-native accents do not define them or their ability to speak English. And I think this is also very important because there are more non-native speakers of English than native speakers of English in the world. And so these students are going to go out after learning English and communicate with other non-native speakers, more likely than a native one. Uh, just a few things about using the non-native model in the classroom, a couple of ideas. Um, YouTube, uh, again, just like everyone else, I'm not getting paid by YouTube or anything, but it's uh, YouTube I think is a great uh, tool to use. There's one video I found in particular that I really like, and it highlights both the native and non-native speakers they could be celebrities or world leaders or athletes, and they're all being interviewed, but they're all speaking English. Uh, and I think it's a great model of these global Englishes being used. Um, you can also use either local or foreign, depending on where you're at, um, news videos, newspaper clips, or other media. And I think what could really resonate with students as well is that you can consider inviting a non-native speaker if you know one uh, to talk to the class about their story and how they learn English and maybe any tips they have I think would be a, a good idea as well and something as simple as having a dialogue with your students to address some of these biases and prejudices in uh, English la language learning including na native speakers and um, because like I said, before I found this topic, I didn't know it was it even existed. So I feel like a lot of students probably have the same uh, experience. They might not know uh, what native speakerism is. Uh, so to conclude, the, uh, even though the awareness of the I this ideology is growing, I think more people are, are starting to discover it like, like I did. Um, it is still prevalent, and so to try to combat this, we can integrate these numerous Englishes that are used around the world into our ESL classrooms, and to normalize accented English. And for the non-native English teachers and students to become more comfortable for, uh, in their identities as English speakers, their pronunciation abilities should be supported, respected, and welcomed both in the classroom and also beyond outside of the classroom. Uh, so again, I would just like to thank you so much. Uh, a special thanks again to uh, Dr. Sefaroglu, uh, Farid and Johanna for being our wonderful moderators and for putting this together, um, both of the universities and for all of you attending. I very much appreciate it and I'm very honored to be here. So thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel, for your presentation. And, and you, maybe you have followed the uh, messages on the chat. I don't know, but there are some interesting messages. So let me read one of them. Uh, I think Sofia or Safia. <laughs> so that was a very good example. So let me check. So um, <laughs> I'm trying to find the message here. Okay. So just a second. So uh, Safiye Nur Kahya says, uh, her name is Safiye. Uh, I am working at a private school in Turkey and my manager introduced me as Sofia instead of Safiye oh. <laughs> to, to the children uh, and not Safiye. Parents think that I'm not Turkish. Um, what can you say about that, Rachel? So yeah, I think this, this is one of the, I don't know, strategies or techniques, you know, so that, you know, students should not speak their L1. I mean, right, yeah. Might, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> and some others also say that, you know, I have to speak only in English. And, um, and another message says that, you know, native speakers have, of course, advantages over the non-native speakers. 
So what can you say about the uh, Sophia and Safia examples? <laughs> Less I, I, I think that's so unfortunate. Uh, I, it's hard to hear stuff like that, um, but that's a perfect example. Um, something that comes to mind is also my experience in South Korea. I had, um, it's kind of along the same vein. I had a, a colleague who taught, uh, she was from South Africa. And so I was talking to her and she was saying that the teachers in her school asked her to speak in an American accent, which was so weird to me because she's South African and they hired her knowing she's South African. And so there can even be those, those little micro, uh, you know, preferences, if you want to call it that, of, for example, in South Korea, they wanted North American. And I feel like it's so sad because, um, the accent really, in my opinion, doesn't have anything to do with how you can, you know, your ability to teach. It doesn't have anything to do with uh, your degrees that you've earned. And so I think looking more at your qualifications than where you come from is so important. And that's why I, I feel a little strongly about this topic is that, uh, again, it's so sad to hear that you were introduced to Sophia um like i said maybe just like who knows why maybe to to make you seem like a native speaker again it doesn't it doesn't make your education or your experiences it has nothing to do with that and it's very unfortunate that that's still happening well uh, thank you so much rachel another message so uh panar uh, says uh, in classrooms accent or uh, fluency is uh, given great importance, especially at university. So actually that was uh, the, the question that I was going to ask. So uh, you have analyzed the advertisements, right? And uh, I don't know whether you have checked the institutions. I mean, are there any differences between, you know, the institutions, uh, primary school institutions, I don't know, schools, secondary schools, high schools, university, you know? So are there any differences in the advertisements? Have you checked that? I mean, does it matter the level? I mean, um, I think it also depends on the area in the world. Um, so I know a lot of the Asian in particular, just because I've, I've been there and, and uh, I have friends and colleagues who have taught there and, uh, and such, um, that a lot of times it is very native, like, like a, again the advertisements even at the university level i've seen are ask for native speakers in particular um so uh i taught at an elementary school and they have a national program there um so the government funds people to come over and teach english um to their uh, students in the public setting and uh, that's another Thing is that you have to be from a certain country where English is the native language. Um, so definitely in the public realm, they're very still very much focused on the nativeness of the teacher. And there's also after school programs, and it's kind of the same thing. Uh, they want native speakers. Um, I don't have any personal experience in South America, but from what we were uh, looking at, a lot of it was, um, if not native speaker, then native-like speaker. Uh, so even at the university level, at least in Asia, they still uh, were kind of focused on the, the nativeness. Yeah. So Emma also says that it depends on the sector, I think, IT sector, for instance, IT sector is dominated by non-natives owing to their computer skills, so language has minor influence in such sectors. Yeah, of course, so regarding English language teaching, you know, the situation yeah, might be different. And there are some, you know, other messages, but I cannot follow because <laughs> there are some new messages coming. Um, so it says native speaker, Brock says native speakerism is a sort of marketing strategy to allure customers into mm -hmm. purchasing the best English. Uh, yeah, yeah, it might be because I don't know. Uh, yeah, there are some changes in the TOEFL test to include some mm -hmm. Englishes. 
uh, but maybe it's because of the also examination system. You know, uh, there are some sure. you know exams and they have specific accents practice in those right. you know tests, and therefore uh, you know test takers might like to have native speakers and don't you think that is an interesting topic because you are a native speaker and you say that native speaker being a native speaker is not <laughs> i worry i wouldn't say that <laughs> yeah I, I i just feel like um i've had teachers that are not native speakers um yeah. it wasn't for english necessarily but um as long as i can comprehend what they're saying um they are genuinely good teachers. And I think that a lot of times, particularly in Asia, we got kind of a bad reputation because they would have these native speakers come over, uh, for example, in South Korea. And what they would do instead of being a teacher or wanting to, you know, teach these children and, and become a positive light, they would go party on the weekends. It was kind of, they took it as more of a vacation than a job. And so, you know, when compared to, that's an extreme example, but compared to that type of teacher, to someone who might not be a native speaker, but really cares about their students and knows what they're doing and knows how to teach. I just think it, it's, it's not very important in my, in my view. A good teacher doesn't mean that you're a native speaker necessarily. And a lot of native speakers, uh, as far as like writing and reading and stuff like that, Sometimes they don't really know <laughs> what they're doing. It's kind of a, uh, I've seen it time and again where, uh, you know, people, my peers have failed English, even though it's their first language, they may not be very knowledgeable about, about the, the language themselves. So Rachel, let me tell you something about what I experienced. You know, a native speakers have some advantages, you know, some of the messages indicate that. So the use of idioms, for example, uh, I was at a conference and, you know, during the break, uh, uh, I said to one of the participants at the conference, would you like to have, have some coffee? And uh, he responded, rain check. And I just look out of the window. <laughs> because I didn't know that, you know. So uh, what is the relationship between, the, you know, the rain and the check? I didn't know that express, honestly speaking. And I just, you know, checked Google and learned that it means not now, but later. <laughs> you know, there are some <laughs> <laughs> certain things like yeah. that's very interesting. <laughs> you know. Okay, thank you so much, Rachel. And uh, uh, wait a moment, wait a moment, yeah. sorry. Uh, we have, I guess, three, uh, three people waiting with questions still. Yeah, really? um, uh -huh. So, so we'll let, uh, let give all a possibility to ask um, the questions. Okay. Uh, I can so, see Merv, uh, Safia. Safia, I think we should start with Safia. <laughs> okay, Sophie, and Erdem so, yeah. uh, as well. <laughs> yeah, please. Okay, just a second. Uh huh. Hi. Okay. Hi. Hello. Hello. Oh, let me. Okay. <laughs> Hello, Sophia. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Okay. Oh, I raised my hand. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm kind of a bit <laughs> excited right now. <laughs> okay. The thing is, uh, you said that, uh, yes, it's a good technique actually in the schools. I prefer to speak only in English. I am working at a kindergarten right now. And uh, the exposure of the English is very important in early ages. I know that. I mean, uh, but it would be better if I have a right to say something because the thing is that um, they ask me to speak in English with the parents too. I mean, they try to translate like I am a native speaker, but I um, <laughs> sometimes I'm, you know, uh, walking in the streets and some parents see me late they're like oh hi Sophie and I'm like <laughs> oh my god <laughs> I'm a Turkish for god's sake you know my accent is clear I'm not you know uh, I don't have a Turkish accent like 100 uh, percent but why did they do that I don't know and it's bad I mean uh, I know that the technique is uh, better you know speaking English but this is 
this is mobbing. <laughs> I don't like this. I hate it. <laughs> because um, the, the, the problem with the parents, you know, they uh, pay too much for the schools and they expect, you know, to, uh, you know, how can I say it? I, I pay this and there I have a native teacher. They want to, you know, leave that, but no. Right. I agree completely. It's, it's, very unfortunate. I think that parents do have a lot of influence as well. Uh, you see that in Asia as well, too. Um, and it's, it's very sad, though, because also I feel like that kind of shifts or tries to shift your identity as a Turkish person and as an English uh, speaker. And so uh, it's very unfortunate that that's happening. Uh, and uh, yeah, hopefully we can, you know, be maybe a little more aware. And, and like I said, the whole point is all of these Everyone here uh, speaks English to an extent, and mostly a lot of you, I'm sure, fluently. And um, uh, like I said, as long most conversations between people are between two non-native speakers in the world, and so I think it might be more helpful to hear more accents and, uh, like, Thuri kind of commented on like idioms. Learning those can be very helpful as well. Um, so hopefully, it can it can get better. But yeah. I'm very sorry to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And by the way, uh, I have a question. Um, I know the exposure is very important, but um, what about the psychology of the learners? I mean, I am working with the very young learners and they have a tend to, you know, act like um, they have sincere behaviors, like they want to hug, they want to cuddle, and they want to say something in Turkish, like one uh, one day, one of my students came and, oh, my I, English teacher, I, I painted a picture, and I have to, you know, uh, he said it in Turkish, so I have to uh, act like I don't, you know, understand Turkish, so I have to, you know, move my head like this, and I said, I don't understand you, I'm sorry, but I, I saw that he was, you know, upset that for not uh, connecting with me. So in, in uh, very young learners, I think we have to speak Turkish a bit, like, <laughs> and psychology, because the psychologies are very important in early ages. What do you think? Yeah, I completely agree. Something that happens um, when I was in Busan and teaching in South Korea is that there is uh, I would be at the front of the class, but I would also have what they called a co-teacher. And so these were South Korean people and they would step in to translate if needed. Cause I feel like that's also something that can be very, very useful, not only for the teacher, but for the, the class, because yeah. it kind of goes back to their feelings and their psychology. If they don't understand anything you're saying, or if you're not responding in the way that they, they want or that you should, they're not going to want to learn. They're not going to want to come to class. They're going to feel discouraged. And so I think that's uh, definitely something to consider. And even having occasionally that translation there or that native language, uh, you know, as an option, I think that can definitely be beneficial, especially like you said, for their well-being. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what about you know the authority? Because I offered this uh, situation to my Sophia, colleagues. I'm I'm really sorry for interrupting, um, but you know. <laughs> we have limited time, so maybe okay. we can have you as a you know, speaker for the next time, Safiya. If you would Ooh. like to share your experience with us, yes, why not? Ooh, so you can, what an you honor. Can, yeah, you can get my email address and you can uh, get in touch. <laughs> okay. okay, so Erdem Ojan, so really sorry for interrupting. Erdem Ojan, you were going to say something. Okay, um, can you hear me now? Yeah, sure. Okay, yeah. so I'm going to tell two different uh, things here. The first one is uh, coming from, I think it's from Ankara, and it's going to show us how um, the private sector uh, can go crazy. Um, I think this is uh, published in the PhD thesis of Yasemin Tezgir and Jack Jack, if not mistaken. Yeah. Um, she just... Um, actually showed that a case where the private sector, uh, the managers, um, prepared forged IDs uh, to attract the attention of uh, the, the customers, uh, I mean the customers in the sense of the parents. 
So they prepared fake IDs to pretend they have native speakers working in the school. And the native speaker is like Sofia in this example. So this is something how far the private institutions can go. Um, and the second one is coming from the US. I think this is told by Alifuat Salvoja. Um, there was a couple living in the US and the lady had a PhD in you know, language teaching. Um, and she's originally from Korea, uh, South Korea, and the um, and her boyfriend is from uh, the U.S. had a B.A. in uh, software engineering, and they wanted to go to Far East, um, and found a, a job, you know, post in Taiwan. And um, they both applied, and you know who got the position the one with the software engineering because he's a native speaker. So this is a really uh, you know, concerning thing for me because you have the qualities, you know, um, qualifications, but they prefer something else. So being some you know, native speakers sometimes would be the solution, but uh, in the classroom, uh, it may not really work in that way. So thank you very much for listening to me. Yeah, thank you so much. That is kind of shocking, um, but sadly not not too, I guess, uh, shocking. But um, yeah, to, for someone to have a PhD in education and just because she's not a native speaker, doesn't get it, 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 it makes no sense in, in my mind. Um, again, just like, just because you're a native speaker, uh, speaker doesn't mean you're a good teacher either, you know? So uh, that's very, very shocking and definitely, I think brings light to how extreme this uh, problem can get. All right. So uh, thank you so much, Rachel, again, uh, and the, all the uh, attendees. 